Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Tahar Qasim. I'm the founder of the Liverpool Arab Arts Festival. And now I am a, a board member of the organization. It's my pleasure to introduce you to two outstanding writers, Tim McIntosh Smith and Denise Woods. Tim McIntosh Smith is a historian, Arabist, and traveler whose books include a trilogy on the great Arab wanderer Ibn Battuta, as well as edition and translation of early Arabic texts. In 2011, he was named by Newsweek as one of the 12 finest travel writers of the past 100 years. He has been based in the Arab world for over a third of a century. He spent most of that time in Sana'a, the capital of Yemen. He is a fellow of the Royal Asiatic Society and an Emeritus Senior Fellow of the Library of Arabic Literature. His most recent publication, Arabs, examines 3,000 years of history through the lenses of language and human mobility. It has been described as a book of vast scope and stunning insight. Personally, after reading the first two chapters of the Arabs, a 3000 year history of peoples, tribes and empires, I realized that I learned so much about Muhammad as a prophet and his tribes in Quraysh and Mecca from the time when I started the Quranic school when I was a seven year old boy to the university time. There was hardly any school in Yemen who was prepared to teach me and my fellow pupils about the history of Yemen, its tribes and civilization. What more, we learned that Yemen civilization started when Islam started. Before that, it was Jahiliya. Jahiliya means people do not, did not know or have no history. Even today, after more than 1,400 years, one of the rulers in the north of Yemen claims that he is a dis, uh, descendant of Muhammad's family and therefore has better privileges than the rest of the Yemenis. Here are some of Tim's previous publications. First one is Yemen travels in dictionary land, John Moray, London, 1997, reissued 2007, published in the USA as Yemen, the Unknown Arabia, reissued in the USA in 2014. Travels with a tangerine, a journey in the footnotes of Ibn Battuta, Jean Moray, London, 2001. The whole of a thousand columns, Hindustan to Malabar, with Ibn Battuta, Jean Moray, London, 2005. Landfalls on the edge of Islam, with Ibn Battuta, Jean Moray, London, 2010. Paperback title, Landfalls on the Edge of Islam from Zanzibar to Al-Hamra. Arabs, a 3000 year history of peoples, tribes and empires, Yale University Press, New Haven and London, 2019. 
I would like to introduce Denise Woods. Denise Woods, who also writes as Denise Devlin, is an Irish novelist based in Cork. An Irish writer who knows the world by the Irish Times. Three of her novels are set in the Arab world, including the critically acclaimed Overnight to Innsbruck Lil Lilliput Press, and like nowhere else, Penguin Island. Her sixth novel of Sea and Sand, Hoop Fiction, American University in Cairo Press, is set in Oman and Iraq. Denise is the recipient of an Arts Council of Ireland Literature Bursary, and she has been awarded residencies in Shanghai, Liz Najan, Paris, and Ernest Hemingway's studio in Key West. She is the former director of the West Cork University Festival. If you are enjoying one of our, one of Liverpool Arab Arts Festival free digital events, please donate to Liverpool Arab Arts Festival. 100% of the money raised will go towards commissioning artists for our 2021 festival. The link is on Liverpool Arab Arts Festival website and social media. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Hi, good evening, good afternoon, good morning. Good morning here in Cork and Liverpool. Good afternoon in Kuala Lumpur and good evening to all those around the world who have uh, joined us for this very special event. Thank you, Tahir, for that lovely introduction. My name is Denise Woods and I'm here to have a chat with uh, Tim McIntosh-Smith, who's over in Kuala Lumpur. Hi, Tim. Hi, Denise. Good morning. Yes, it's afternoon here and um, I'm sitting in front of a vista of skyscrapers and, and general Southeast Asia bling. It's really quite fun. Yeah, I've and seen... you're off in leafy cork. Yes, green and raining, I can tell you now. And, you know, before we kick off, I really should congratulate Liverpool because it's all over the news this morning. This event oh, obviously God, yeah. is being really recorded. They've won, they've won the league. And I think, uh, given we're here with the Liverpool Arts Arab Arts Festival, who've organised this uh, lovely chat, um, go Liverpool. Yay. Fabulous city. Um, yeah, congratulations. Okay. Tim, well, well done, yeah, Um Now, look, uh, an awful lot of your fans will be aware of the fact that you're a long-time uh, resident of Yemen, but you're now in Malaysia. So do you want to explain a bit why we find you in Kuala Lumpur? Yes. Um, I spent uh, about four and a half years through the sort of major bit of the war um, and, and of course as, as many of you know it really was quite major uh, missiles flying and things going bang all around people getting killed um, people I know getting killed lots of them particularly sons of people I know getting killed much too young yeah, and it, it really has been the most dreadful time um, uh, indescribably dreadful, as any war is. Um, but there we were, right in the middle of it, um, kind of sitting it out and thinking, you know, I kept thinking, oh, you know, we had the London Blitz in the Second World War. My, my parents went through blitzes in Britain and, you know, what's this? But on and on it went much longer than, than, the, the, than the, the blitzes in the UK. And, you know, eventually, uh, I, I, I'm very close to a family in Sana'a and always have been, you know, ever since I've been there. 
36, 37 odd years ago, I've been particularly close to one family. And two of the young people in the family who I think of as godchildren in a sense, and um, we're, we're all very close. They, they were at a stage where they wanted to go to university and, and, and we kind of looked at possibilities. Uh, and here in Malaysia, you can come as a Yemeni citizen. The Malaysian government is very, very open to receiving Yemenis who want to come here and study here and live here, and, and they're very generous in that way. So we thought of Malaysia as being a good foil to all this, all this war and suffering, uh, and also somewhere which has had its own problems in the past. Uh, I mean, about the time before the time I was born, um, 60 odd years ago, they, they had problems here in Malaysia, but they have overcome those problems. Uh, and, and all the sort of different um, communities, ethnic communities in Malaysia now live together. So coming here for, for us who went through, who have gone through all this, um, this terrible conflict in Yemen and, 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 and seeing a society which is very diverse, but which manages to live together happily and in peace. That, that is in itself a huge lesson. So I'm thinking of, of it for my own purposes as a kind of sabbatical um, from, from the war in Yemen. Uh, and I'm also supporting the, the, two, uh, the two young people, uh, Shema and Muhammad. Um, so that gives me a lot of pleasure. But, uh, but I think of myself as, uh, as an exile. Yemen is my hope. Um, and whatever happens, it will always be my home. It's been my home for 36 years. Uh, and, and that is, um, it's a good bit more than half of my life. It's yeah. all my adult life, in fact. It's my entire adult life that I have spent there. And you don't give up something like that easily, however bad things are. Mm. Well, we might, <clears throat> we might get back to Yemen again a bit later. Um, after one of your readings, uh, I mean, all I can say is a friend, and I should say here maybe that we are old friends. Old, uh, so our friendship started with a correspondence of 14 years before we ever met. Just in case people think I'm being a bit familiar in my, in my approach. Oh. Um, but no, but you know, for five years, and I mean, I have other Yemeni friends waking up every mo every morning checking Twitter, you know, to see if you know to see what bombings that happened during the night because a lot of news you're, you're, a, you're a very good you're a very good twitter checker well, um, uh, quite, it, 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 quite, quite often i was getting news from you <laughs> before i even knew it on the ground that you were twittering uh, uh, or speaking to me and saying oh oh the bomb's gone off um you know i'd sort of vaguely heard a, a bang somewhere in the middle of my sleep but you were kind of actually more worried on on uh, on, yeah, because, on our behalf. <clears throat> At my, the Yemeni activists were on Twitter. That was the way, I mean, the news agencies weren't covering a lot of it. The Yemeni activists sometimes putting themselves at risk were, and that's how I'd be on Twitter every morning to make sure you were all all right, or hope that you were all all right. Anyway, moving on to this magnificent book, uh, for which as a friend and a fan, a big fan, I congratulate you. Arabs, a 3000 year history of peoples, tribes and empires. It's your sixth book. Um, I reckon it's going to be on the bookshelves for hundreds of years. I certainly hope so. And I hope it's going to be taught and read widely through the ages, uh, assuming, of course, that we all survive the age of COVID. But, but no surprise, it's received extraordinary and unanimous reviews. And I'm just going to read a few of them. I mean, there are dozens. And uh, as you know, they have been very, very good. So uh, this brilliant and fasc fascinating history book will change the way we analyze the happenings in the Arab world. That's the Washington Book Review. Macintosh Smith combines deep learning with penetrating insights delivered with dazzling turns of phrase and illuminating comparisons. That's the Observer. Extraordinary, New Statesman. A work of brilliance, Anthony Satin. A thoroughly remarkable achievement unlike any other such history, The National. Uh, the Spectator comments on the vast scope and stunning insight which rebalances Arab history. 
masterly and brilliant. This book could be written by a writer with the knowledge, I beg your pardon, this book could only be written by a writer with the knowledge of the geography of the Arab soul as well as the Arab land. That's Simon Seabag Montefiore. I think that's a beautiful review. And finally, a dazzling achievement. I have never felt so transported, so entertained, and so immersed. And so say all of us. Go you. <laughs> My hat size has grown uh, several sizes bigger. Um, thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you, Denise. And 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 let me take this opportunity. I, you know, I, we mustn't get too loving because this is a a, a, a sort of um, public occasion. But you, Denise were my single greatest support by far in the writing of that great tome. And it was you that I leaned to and you that I whinged to and complained to when things were, were being difficult. And, um, you know, it's, it's quite difficult actually writing a book with, with missiles going off left, right and center. Um, and, um, uh, and, and, and you were the person that I put a lot of my uh, emotional baggage on, uh, and, and you helped me carry it very manfully, womanfully, uh, personfully. Thank you, thank you, but I take absolutely no credit for, thank you very much, but no, you did this under extraordinary circumstances, and it's all the more extraordinary, you know, the result of it is just, uh, well, like I said, a masterpiece. Uh, now, coming up to your first reading, um, in, you know, prior to this book coming out, you were largely termed um, a travel writer. And in fact, the Newsweek in 2011 named you as one of the finest travel writers of the last hundred years, which I think is kind of cool. Uh, but you've never liked to be bracketed between those two words, you know, travel writer, because all your books, uh, well, certainly travel books, are histories, you know, from the Yemen book, through to landfalls, through to the Arabs, and even your novel uh, is a historical novel, a thriller set in Alhambra. Great my novel. Oh, yes, yes. Oh, I, That's true, yes. I forget my novel. <laughs> but you also, you write about time. You've often said that you write a lot about time, and certainly in the, I, certainly in the IB trilogy, your readers come time traveling with you, sometimes to an overwhelming extent. I know you were sometimes overwhelmed by IB's presence when you were writing, but for the reader, likewise, it, it could be quite disconcerting. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I be, uh, sorry, I be being Ibn Battuta. Yeah. I beg your pardon, so, yes. Yes, I beg your pardon. Uh, uh, Ibn Battuta, the famous 14th century Moroccan traveller who travelled around the Islamic world, um, and yeah, and I wrote about it. Yes. And, I, yes, you're right. I, 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 I mean, I don't want to get all sort of ghosty and spiritualist, but um, uh, and, and, and I longed actually to bump into his ghost. Uh, which I didn't, um, but so often I felt myself looking over, I think I called it at one point, a, a kind of cliff of time where you could actually jump off the cliff and be back in the past in, in one sort of fell swoop. Um, so yeah, time, those books with, which, which are classed as travel books um, by the publishers are in fact time books time travel books mm. and your uh, your first reading you've come back to time again mm. you've chosen a passage about time for your yeah. first time it, it's i mean time does very strange things and um you know obviously if you're writing a history you can you can just say first this happened and then that happened and then that happened but to me that's not so much a history as a, a, a as a, as a a chronicle or a book of annals, um, um, and, and and history itself has to be a bit a bit more flexible. So I kind of toyed with how to view the passage of time vis-à-vis -vis the Arab world or the Arabic world, as, as, as I prefer to call it. Um, and I definitely don't think it, it, it would be very helpful to just to say first this happened and then that and then that. Um, obviously, uh, patterns repeat themselves, so you can think of a kind of wheel of time. You can add that to a timeline, and you can think of it as a sort of wheel trundling along 
a line. But even that doesn't seem to get the complexities of, uh, um, of, of Arab history. So this, this is what this passage is about. I'm, I was looking for a sort of image um, to, to explain how time works. And, 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 and I'll read it anyway. Exploring Arab history means stepping now and again off the timeline, looking ahead as well as back. Time present and time past, as T.S. Eliot knew, are both perhaps present in time future, and time future contained in time past. Now, this complexity is the bane of all historians, but maybe most of all for historians of Arabs. Years and pages turn in sequence, but not necessarily action and reaction, cause and effect. Causes, factors, tragic flaws may remain latent for centuries, even millennia, until they work themselves out, if they ever do. An extreme, though trifling, instance is one in which, in the mid-20th century, a village sheikh, or chief of the village, demanded that the British colonial authorities in Adam should pay for an old well to be dug out and reinstated. His argument was that the well had been filled in by a Roman expeditionary force in 26 BC, um, and that the Romans and the British were both species of Frank, they were both Efranges, uh, or you know, Europeans, uh, and therefore the British should uh, dig out what the Romans had filled in um, 2,000 years on. A more serious instance is that concerning the transfer and nature of power in the post-Mohammedan state. The problem has boiled up intermittently but bloodily over the past 1,400 years. Clearly, the wheel alone, trundling steadily along its timeline, is not always enough. We need another image, repetitious, yet arbitrary. As often, poets have the answer. The Syrian poet, Nizar Kabani, who I'll come back to, he, he, he has actually furnished me with quite a lot of my historical thinking. The Syrian poet Nizar Kabani saw the ever-present Arab past as the hourglass that swallows you night and day. That past is the sand in the bottom of the glass, waiting for the next turn of events. Nizar Kabani knew that history is no mere timepiece or pastime, but a player in its own right, often malevolent. It is the hourglass squatting there, marking time, not measuring it, until it is turned once more, and then you see that the grains are human lives or human deaths, for the people of both the quicksand and its victims. You can count the grains. 6,600 civilians killed by the war in my adopted land, Yemen. At least 50,000 dead combatants, many of them no more than boys, perhaps 85,000 younger children, infants under the age of five, starved quietly to death by war's old ally, poverty. These are the stark statistics so far. They were as I let go of the book at the end of 2018, so you can add more to those figures now. Would those who turned the hourglass have done so if they had known, or even if they could have guessed? So that's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a rather somber and bleak image um, through which to view history. The, the image of the, of the hourglass, and people come along, they turn it. But yeah, when you talk about uh, about Yemeni refugees not arriving in Europe, yes, that's quite true, and and, and it's so there are so many resonances from the past and, and from the great first document, if you like, of, of, of Arab history, the Quran, um, in, in which there's the old story of, of Saba and, and the dam 
uh, and the dam breaking and then the, 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 the peoples of Sabah dispersing um, and, and becoming like a tale once told, almost like a sort of forgotten people. And that's how I rather see the Yemenis of you at the moment. Um, you know, sad is not the word, it's, it's more than sad. Uh, it's it's more than tragic. It's more than uh, I, I can't describe it. All I could do, in a sense, was try to explain why things happen and how the hourglass gets turned. And 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 and, and this is really, I hate to say it, it's part of why this book that I've written um, is actually as, as good as it is. Um, yeah. One, one reviewer, I think, and, and I was very, very proud of this, he, he compared it, the, my writing of it in Sama, in the middle of the war, to Brodel writing uh, the history of the Mediterranean in the, during the Second World War, when he was stuck in, um, I think it was Marseille. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I, I, I've actually drawn allusions myself to, to uh, I, you know, I wouldn't want to compare myself directly with Ibn Khaldun, but Ibn Khaldun kind of banged out his, his, his picture of history, his, his, his shape to history, while he was sort of sitting in a little tower in um, uh, what's now Algeria, um, yeah. but surrounded by warring factions. Uh, and, and, and I kept seeing myself in the same sort of um, light as Ibn Khaldun. Absolutely. Um, and I mean, that passage you read, for me, echoes the really moving dedication you put at the beginning of Arabs. Um, in memory of a unified Yemen, 1990 to 2014, and of Ali Hussein Ashab, 1988 to 2016, and all the others who died with it. Um, who was Ali Hussein Ashab? A, a son of a friend, was it? Or yeah, he's um, uh, if the children with me here are godchildren, then he was a he was a kind of god nephew, um, and uh, he was from um, uh, a sort of tribal area just outside Sanaa. Um, and uh, in fact, the area where the old president of Yemen, Ali Abdullah Saleh, came from. So when President Ali Abdullah Saleh went in with um, the new rulers of Yemen uh, on their side, um, our Ali went off to, to fight on behalf of, of him. Um, and it was terribly sad. I mean, the, his. His elder brother was going to go, and um, we said, no, no, your father's dead, you're head of the family, there are people relying on you, you mustn't go. And, um, and so the younger brother, Ali, kind of um, did a, a, a runner in the night and came back in a, in a box, you know, burned to bits. So, um, it, you know, <laughs> and he's not the only one close to home. That I know who, who, who was killed in similar circumstances. But what's the point? And uh, okay. who is it who wrote? And if they ask us why we died, tell them because our fathers lied. I forget who wrote that about the First World War, mm. um, but um, you know it echoes down the years. Absolutely, and we oh. keep making the same mistakes. We keep making the same mistakes. Yeah. Yeah. Getting, getting on to your um, other reading, um, you were first approached to write this uh, in about 2009 by Yale University Press. Um, and there had been lots of, well, not lots, but many history of the Arabs, um, including Hindi and Hurani would be the two most prominent ones, maybe in the English language. Um, but a lot of them took as their starting point Islam, the birth of Islam. Whereas you've gone much further back, you've gone twice as far back to the birth of Arabic and to the first known inscription uh, that refers to the Arabs in 853 BC. 
So you've put Arabic, not Islam, uh, as the unifying force in Arab history and as the sort of locomotive that's pulling your history along. And I just wonder, was it obvious from the outset it had to be language, uh, you know, that was going to be the, the string yeah, um, of the book? Or did you have other, did you think about other, you know, options, approaches to telling the history? Um, yeah, I, I, no, I, I should correct you here, actually. I, actually, I don't like correcting you. Um, but yeah, that, that, that first um, inscription that mentions Arabs of 853 BC is not in Arabic, um, which is not what okay. you said. But okay. yeah, yeah. It's, it's, an it's an inscription um, uh, by the Assyrian Empire. And yeah. it mentions um, uh, a guy called uh, Jindibu or Jundub, I suppose he'd be in, in modern Arabic, which means cricket. Uh, not, the, not the game cricket, but the, the, the grasshopper. Um, and he had, um, uh, he, had, he had rented out a thousand camels as a sort of mercenary force in, in a war. Um, so yeah, he's mentioned as being uh, Arab and, and he's kind of the first Arab that we definitely know about in history. Um, the, uh, yeah, that inscriptions in Arabic come a lot later. They come uh, as much as a thousand years after that. But um, Arabic itself um, is much, much older than Jindibu and that inscription. And, you know, we don't actually know how old it is, but these clever people who could work out and do um, uh, sort of family trees of languages and work out proto-Semitic and things like that. Um, uh, they, 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 they think that Arabic emerged, uh, you know, way before that, thousands of years ago. More exactly than that, I wouldn't want to say, but um, well before 853 BC. So yeah, why choose Arabic? Um, <laughs> You know, obviously you're writing about Arabs. A lot of people who write about Arabs um, not only start with Islam, as you said, but they really end up writing about Islamic civilization. And they write Islamic history, um, which, you know, fascinating though it is, it's not really quite the same as Arab history. Um, so you have to kind of do the basic thing and define who it is you're writing about and what makes Arabs Arabs. Um, and it's actually a very difficult question. I mean, it's difficult for all of us. Uh, and I wrote in the book about, you know, how we all, we're all rather like old fashioned traveling trunks and we're covered with labels, um, you know, and I'm British, English, a bit Scottish, you know, Yemeni by virtue of living there. Um, Etc. Etc. Celtic, you know, Anglo-Saxon, the whole lot. I've got you know Hungarian antecedents, um, but generally one label tends to kind of stick harder than the others. Um, and, and, and Arabs stuck to these very diverse people uh, as, a, as, a, as a name. And it seems you know it seems probably to mean people who live beyond the pale, out in the um, in the steppe lands um, to begin with. But for more time than not, it, uh, the, the name Arab has described people who speak Arabic. Uh, yeah. So it, it, it's a bit of a kind of, um, you, you've always got to fudge the issue. Um, but you can't say, oh, Arab meant that, and then it meant that, and then it meant that. I mean, I do to a certain extent. But I have to look and see what is the main thing that really holds people together over time and holds people together at any moment in time. Uh, and more often than not, it's language. And this is actually why Islam is so important. I mean, it's obviously desperately important as, 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 as a religion. Um, uh, but it's also important as, as uh, having its major miracle and the major um, deed of, 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 of its prophet was to transmit a book in the Arabic language and then 
for this book to be written down. And it was, it was really having this written language that made people, uh, if you like, coalesce. Um, so, for example, people in Yemen uh, would never have thought of themselves as Arabs in the dim and distant past. Um, but uh, over the centuries before Islam, they began to speak Arabic. And then they ended up with this amazing book, the Quran, which gave them a written uh, and, and sort of fixed point of reference to their language and to their peoplehood. I don't really want to say nationhood or ethnicity or anything, but it, it, it's, it's more than that anything that made them into a group. And you can look back from the Quran and you can look forward and see what language does. And you can look, as I say, a long, long way back from, from the Quran to the beginnings of Arabic, uh, you know, several thousand years BC, uh, probably up in the, um, the Fertile Crescent. Mm. Um, uh, well, definitely up in the Fertile Crescent. Um, but you can look at the way it spread around and how people began to identify themselves as, uh, as, as Arabs. And it's, it's really language that holds the whole thing together. And I just want to give you, I mustn't wrap it on too much about language because I'm a bit obsessed with it. But I want to give you an image um, that I borrowed from uh, Al Mas'udi, the, uh, the great um, ninth, 10th century Arabic and Arab historian. And he said that writing history is like finding a load of. Um, gemstones of different shapes and colors uh, and then arranging them in order to make a beautiful necklace um, and that's really what I've tried to do and to make your necklace you have to have a string uh, and my string is language uh, because it, it's kind of the thread that runs through history more strongly than anything else in my opinion so will you read from, from that early section? I mean, the early sections of the book that deal with high Arabic and high Arabic poetry, and even before then, some of those inscriptions, <coughs> um, I found that whole part of the book just, just gripping because uh, it was all so new. And it is a, a beautiful passage, this one, um, about Salim, yeah. you know. Salim, or, yeah, or whoever he is, Salim, Salam. Uh, I'll, 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 I'll come to it. Um, yeah, I, I was trying to kind of listen to the very earliest voices that we have in Arabic. Um, and this is what I found. Littered across the stony deserts of modern Syria, Jordan, and northern Saudi Arabia, where the peninsula, the Arabian peninsula, is mortised into the Fertile Crescent. That is precisely in the area where the earliest Arabs roamed with their herds, according to the Assyrian inscriptions and mentions in the, the, the Old Testament, the Hebrew Old Testament. In this area, there are scores of thousands of graffiti pecked into the boulders that dot the landscape. The main script used is Nabataean, the precursor of Arabic script. The date is quite a lot later than those early Assyrian and biblical references to Arabs, probably from the end of the, the last millennium BC. Um, but before the appearance of Nabataean in the final third of that millennium, the writers probably had no letters in which to express themselves. The language is not quite Arabic as we know it, but it's close. Closer perhaps than Anglo-Saxon is to English. Bending the linguistic taxonomy a little, it wouldn't be far out to say that these are our first authentic Arabic documents. Uh, most of them are names, and most of the names have lineages. Um, so it's like Kilroy, you know, Kilroy was here, I was here. Um, and it's just sort of A, son of B, son of C, some of D. Um, sometimes the, link, the lineages extend back an extraordinary 15 generations and more. I think the record is 17 generations. 
how many of your gen uh, how many generations of your ancestors can you remember, Denise? How many can I remember? Uh, not very many. Yeah. Extraordinary. And in the cases where with luck and scholarly patience they can be cross-checked with other graffiti, the genealogies are consistent. The present day book would be to remember one's pedigree back to the time of Shakespeare or the Pilgrim Fathers. But the graffiti writers were not just walking family trees. There are everyday glimpses such as that of a herdsman who, and I quote, uh, spent the early spring on this plain and fed on truffles. Lucky man, come out, truffles. Um, and there are more poignant records like that of uh, the, the guy you mentioned. Uh, he might be Salim, Salam, Salim. Um, anything else because uh, uh, we, we don't have um, vowels to help us read the names um, and he, he says that he helped the goats bring forth their young and so oh Lat Lat it was the great goddess oh Lat grant security and he mourned for Manil his son who had died distressed overshadowed the grief is audible even now. But there is fun too. Another informal epigrapher wrote that he was very lovesick for a maiden and had joyous sex with her. And there is rivalry, as when graffiti writers add something rude, um, like graffiti writers do all over the place, um, to the inscriptions of their rivals. There are also plenty of scratched heads among the present day interpreters of these ancestral voices. Does the verb etama, for instance, mean to mourn, to finish? Uh, graffiti being what they are, the context is often as minimal as the landscape, as the desert landscape they're in. What's perhaps most remarkable, however, is the social context and its continuity. Patterns of pastoral migration that can be teased out of the graffiti repeat themselves, not just in the past. So somebody writes, 2,000 years ago. This is his camping place year after year. And you, you know, you have to imagine him sitting there, bored out of his head, watching the camels. Um, you know, he's already pecked uh, 20 camels onto the rock. Um, and it seems that these people actually learned the letters as a sort of game. You know, they weren't scribes or, you know, immediate literateurs. Um, but it's, it's, you know, it, it was like a game to pass the time, it seems. That, that's the only explanation. Um, so, yeah, that guy wrote, this is his camping place year after year. Um, and, you know, people have the same camping places now, 2,000 years later. Uh, so, too, the figures of speech continue. In one graffito, the writer records that a torrent made him flee in the season of Suhail. That is in late August, when the star of hail or Canopus rises. In the same area, 2,000 years later, in the 20th century, the royal of Edwin proverb warns, when still hails overhead, trust not the torrent bed. Uh, and there's another theme mentioned in words and prayers and shown in pictures, one that will repeat itself with catastrophic regularity and which clearly played a part in both the culture and the economy, and that is raiding other people's herds. Herding and raiding took these people to the steplands. It kept them there on the move and ensured that they remained politically disunited. And the pattern all began long before these earliest authentic voices, before even the Assyrians and Genesis. And some people would say, you know, the pattern repeats till today, herding and raiding. True, true. Uh, and you described those guys, you know, that it was a game, language was a game, or the, or the inscription, you know, the, the signs were a game. It's uh, like they're fiddling with their phones. That's what they do now. They just fiddle Yeah, with their phones. yeah. I mean, it seems it, it, there's um, one scholar has, uh, has drawn a parallel with some of the. Um, uh, I think they're the, like the Berber, you know, Amazigh tribes in, in North Africa who 
um, you know, they write Arabic and so on, but, but the herdsmen, they have a, a particular script that they write graffiti in. Um, and it just seems to be a game. And it seems to be that's what these guys were doing. I mean, yeah, they, they didn't actually but, need to write. Yeah, but it's, um, I mean, that quote, the first one about Salim, let's call him, um, it's mm. so close to the bone. I mean, it was very, the first time I read it, I just felt for this man, you know, millennia ago, who did, and everything was yeah. in there. You know, the work was in there, family was in there, uh, love, loss, grief, um, it's all in there. It's just so relatable. And that's why I think those- Yeah, those and they're not, they're not mediated by, they're not mediated by, by, his, by historians. They're the actual voices and it's like, uh, it's the nearest you can get to listening to a to a tape recording or a, you know a digital recording of those voices at that mm. time. And you know some some people would disagree with me in calling them Arabic. Um, and technically speaking, they're North Arabian. Um, uh, but um, well, without getting into in, 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 into the details. Ar Arabic is a lot wider than, than the, um, the standard Arabic or the classical Arabic that you and I um, studied. Um, and, you know, my, my criterion is that if I can transcribe these graffiti into Arabic letters and show them to the kids and they can get an idea of what they're saying, then it's Arabic of a sort. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um... You know, you go on from there in the book, and we, we have to move on from language, sadly, but, uh, you know, to talk about high Arabic and the poetry, you know, in terms of its role and spreading the word and everything, but you describe it sort of as the, the archaeology of the desert, it, it, you know, it, it, um, or the, the Arabs, um, Pompeii or whatever, because, and that it has to be excavated because it's so rich and mm. so telling of their history. Mm. Yeah, and I, I mean, if 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 you are obviously if you're if you're a, 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 a nomad, which the earliest Arabs seem to have been, it seemed to be a descriptive, you know, one of their characteristics that they were nomads. I mean, you move around and you don't build things by and large, um, so you don't leave physical arche archaeological remains. Um, but uh, well, and, and for that matter, we don't actually have any definite, definite, definite poetry before about the sixth century, but that, that is quite early. Um, and the nice thing about Arabic poetry is that it's described in, in almost in, in architectural terms, you know, so you have a, a bait is, is a line of poetry and the bait, as you know, is a, is a, a dwelling, you know, either a house or a tent. Um, and it has a, a two uh, sh shatran, shatrain, um, two halves, and uh, I think it's there sometimes called um, misra'an, the two, um, uh, which are the two panels of the door to open, and you have, you know, what is an egg, and all these various other um, terms that really go with houses used uh, used for poetry. So you can kind of archaeologize poetry. Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting uh, way of looking at it. And I, I really love the way you wrote, wrote, wrote those passages. Uh, we must move on, though, quickly um, to the Baghdad years and <laughs> to a must. Yeah. Oh, I'll be in a hurry. I mean, this is a book about 3,000 years. You can't rush 3,000 years. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I know. And we could look, we could chat all morning. Anyway, but we're going to move move on to to Baghdad and to another nasty yeah. individual. You're, you know, you have quite a few nasty individuals in your books, and you're oh, worried about them with, you know. Uh, well, I've got some nice people as well, haven't I? Of course you do. It's just that these guys stand out there. There. Well, I leave you to it. And, and he was also a great orator. This guy. He was. Was, um... Yeah, I mean, and, and, and that's why why I suggested reading a bit about him because I, I mean, for, well, first of all, he's he's kind of um, he's quite a good character in himself. But yeah, he was he was a good, a brilliant orator. In fact, Al Hajjaj Ibn Yusuf, a Thaqafi, um, um, 
And he was somebody who used rhetoric to control people, um, which is what quite a lot of my history is about, about how language is used to control people. Um, so he, he, I thought he was a good person to um, uh, to dwell on for a bit, and you know, and he has resonances in in our re very recent history, as as, as you'll find out. Um, not only were the main losers in the first great schism, the Shia or party of Ali, gathering their strength again in in Iraq, so too the their. Oh, let me start again. Not only were the main losers in the first great schism, the Shia of Ali, gathering their strength again in Iraq, so too were their even bulgier arch enemies, the Kharijis, the quitters, who had backed Ali and turned against him. The presence of both groups not only made the idea of unity a phantasm, but also posed a direct threat to the stability of the Umayyad Caliphate. So the Caliph Abdul Malik unleashed on them his imperial rock filer, Al Hajjaj, a viceroy whose bite was quite as bad as his bark. Al Hajjaj ibn Yusuf had begun life as a schoolmaster of the flogging sort. Later, however, he found his true vocation as a soldier. Already notorious for his harshness, it was he who had masterminded the defeat of the anti and during this um, campaign against the anti he had bombarded Mecca and actually uh, destroyed the, the Kaaba, um, the great center of, of, of um, Muslim pilgrimage. Um, over the following couple of years, he acted as a, as a roving troubleshooter, putting down opposition to the Umayyads in various parts of the Arabian Peninsula. Now, at the end of 694, Abdul Malik sent him to sort out that most troublesome land of all, Iraq. The new viceroy was notorious for his rhetoric. al Hajjaj, the forbid that the mosque is ever being the political party, can make Hitler at the Nuremberg sound mealy mouthed. His keynote speech was delivered on his arrival in Cognito in Al Kufa, which at the time was the focus of Khaji descent. He ascended the steps of the pulpit, veiled a red Khaji style turban wrapped around his mouth, and thought like that, surveyed all the other red turbans before him, and began with a line of poetry. I am the son of Bragness, climber of the Holy Mountain Passes. But when I bear myself, you will know me. First revealed as Lucifer, dark brilliant, he continues. I come bearing evil for evil. Wait, wait. I measure the sandals of evil by their footprints. I reward evil with evil. I see heads bright. I see blood, wounded in turbans and beards. Armed men part of the exits, waiting to share home. He put to death by some estimates 120,000 Kharijis and other opponents of the Umayyads, cold blood. And there were 50,000 men and 30,000 women who died in his jails, and the numberless ones killed in the fighting. Are the figures exaggerated? Even reduced by a factor of 10, they would still be terrifying. Like some other schoolmasters, Al Hajjaj enjoyed his reputation as a bogeyman. I am kind hearted and malevolent, cruel and jealous, he once admitted. As an orator despot, he was a darker version of the old tribal Sayyids and Khatibs who ruled the ancient Arabian tribes with words, and his heady mix of eloquence and violence has exercised a dark fascination. In Ibn Khalikhan's great 13th century biographical dictionary of the Arabic world, the 13-page entry on Al-Hajjaj, the man you love to hate, is one of the longest. The fascination lives on. He was a role model for the recent ruler of Iraq, Saddam Hussein. And like that 20th century disciple, has plenty of admirers today. 
No one but Al-Hajjaj and Saddam could keep those dreadful Iraqis under control. It's a sentiment I have heard all month, uh, but not, I hasten to add, from Iraqis. Uh, Al-Hajjaj, for all his cruelty, was one of the greatest Arab or orators in history. Only one person is on record as having silenced him, the wife of Caliph al-Walid ibn Abdul Malik, who, while al-Hajjaj was ensconced with her husband, sent a maidservant to the latter with the message. How can you sit with this Arabi, this Bedouin mule, this Arabi person with weapons when you were wearing nothing but a light tunic? And the Kader sent a message back to say that the Arabi in the yoga was in fact a judge, his governor of Iraq. She was horrified and told him, by Allah, I don't like you being alone with a mass murderer. Overhearing the exchanges with the maid, Al-Hajjaj gave the caliph a lecture on the importance of not listening to women's prattle. This was passed back to Al-Wali's wife, and the following day, she summoned Al-Hajjaj to pay his respects. He was kept waiting. Finally admitted to her veiled presence, he was left standing and given a lecture in return that began, if Allah had not made you the most miserable of his creation, he would not have chosen you to be the one to bombard the Kaaba. On and on it went, concluding with aspersions on his manhood. Al-Hajjaj fled to Caleb and admitted, she did not stop until I wished the earth would swallow me up. And Al-Walid laughed so much that he poured at the ground with his feet. The man who had caused so many deaths was himself destined to die in bed. But there is a chilling twist to his end. Feeling that it was approaching, Al-Hajjaj is said to have summoned an astrologer and asked if he divined the imminent death of the ruler. I do, said the astrologer, but it is not you, because the one who is to die is called Kulay, Poppy. And that I should point out. No, it is I, for that is what my mother used to call me. So, charming. It reminds me a bit of, uh, you know, yeah. Sultan Muhammad Shah. Yeah, yeah charming. Huh? Sorry? Uh, it, it, you know, it's. Um, God is the one who knows, you know, Allahu Alam, uh, as, as um, Arabic writing historians always say, you know, if if if, if all all these accounts that are true, but I, I'm um, I'm merely a, a, a vehicle for transmitting them, and you know, in, I think one has to make characters, uh, one has to fill them out, and you know, if you're inflicting a 650-page book on people. Uh, you should make it readable. It's, it, it, it didn't hurt um, yeah. Thucydides and Edward Gibbon um, to write history yeah. interestingly. And I mean, that was something I was going to talk to you about. Um, you said recently that you were very grateful to have been taught by Patricia Crone, who, t who said at Oxford, you know, that uh, history doesn't have to be dry, that, of course, you know, yeah. the writing matters. And, you know, you're, I mean, it's, it's, it's a shift of subject slightly, but um, moving from Arabic to English, I mean, your prose, your writing is just, um, you know, it's a measure of the fact that this book, in spite of the 600 years, or I mean, sorry, the 600 pages plus, the three millennia and uh, the contortions of history that you've made it so incredibly readable and, and so much fun to read. And I was really interested when you said recently about Patricia Crone and, and learning at Oxford that history doesn't have to be dry. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think, it, it, going back to Al Masoudi, it's, again, it's, it's that business of stringing the, the, the gems on the string. And all right, you can't make it all gems. You can't make it all, you know, astrologers and, 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 and predictions. And, um, you, you know, you have to have the hard analysis. You have to have the, um, the marshalling of facts and the telling of the truth as you see it. Um, 
but to intersperse it with um, illustrations from Arabic writers of history who lived very near the time, I think is perfectly justified. And if you read somebody like al Masrudi or a Tabari or Ibn al Athir, um, you know, they're actually they're fantastic reads. And if you also read the, the, the um, kind of classic Arab, Arabic histories, they tend to go right back to the beginning. You know, in, in my going back um, way before Islam, I'm not doing anything revolutionary. I'm only doing what the old uh, um, Arabic, hist Arabic writing historians did themselves. And, and you know, and, and they saw Islam as the, as, as, as the central event of, of Arab history, as it is, undeniably. Um, and, and you know, it's it, 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 it's the sort of um, it's the centerpiece of the necklace. Uh, it's the great pendant, um, and beautiful pendant. Um, but you know, it goes back before as well as after. And um, you know, the roots of Islam are are, 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 are deep in history, um, as is recognised by Muslim thinkers. Um, so, uh, in, in making my history interesting, and in going back so far, and in giving it this shape where it has 1400 and something years before, 1400 and something years after, um, I'm really taking my cue from Arabic writers of history, or writers of Arabic history, not all of whom are Arabs. Did you have, this is an odd question now, was there somebody looking over your shoulder, a spirit guide, Ibn Khaldun or somebody, I mean, for the, the trilogy, the Ibn Battuta trilogy, you had Ibn Battuta very close by the whole time, but writing this history, was there somebody, you know, any particular writer from the past that you felt, you know, who, was there one that was with you along the way, or a whole, yeah, crowd, I mean, a whole crowd of people in the room? I, it's it's it, uh, no. I mean, obviously, you use so many sources, but but certainly Ibn Khaldun, uh, as as kind of um, having found himself in a not dissimilar situation, and, and if you like, uh, extracting history from the environment around him, uh, or, or 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 looking at history through the lens of the present. Um, and Masoudi, as I as I as I mentioned, yes, definitely. Um, I, I I had all these people on on a sort of um, yeah crowding around 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 you were as well, uh, looking over my shoulder um, and holding my writing up. You were a great support, as I said. Um, but also, uh, no, no, I'm not, I'm not just being nice. You really were. Um, of these other people from the Arab past, um, particularly poets. Um, and I think poets often say uh, the kinds of truths that other people do not say. Um, it's why I've got some of my poetry translated in my book. It's why I kind of begin and end with Nizat Kalbani, the, the great late Syrian poet who lived like, very recently. Um, yeah. Uh, and it's why I quote I quote poetry throughout this book um, because you know uh, poetry works as journalism, poetry works as photography, poetry works as portraiture, poetry works as uh, as, as as sound recording. You know, obviously poetry is uh, Arabic poetry is written in a, in a, in a very high register. Um, yeah, classical yeah. Arabic poetry. Uh, People tended to be reacting to um, uh, to what was happening around them, and with great immediacy. So, as a historian, I can go and look back uh, at these these sort of rushes of history, um, or the first draft of history. Um, you know, today it's journalism, uh, and I think in, in a lot of the Arab past, it's poetry that was the first draft of of history. So I had a, a, a kind of um, cohort of poets crowding around me uh, yeah. 
from no. Seems like it. Yeah, no, we're, <clears throat> we're beginning to run out of time. Um, Ooh, got it. Yeah. Um, which it is seems like, we're just starting scratching. We're, we're only scratching the surface. Well, I know <laughs> it's a big book. It's a big book. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I loved your next reading, especially the first paragraph of it um, about Syria. Um, can you maybe just just give give that short reading, um, shorten it a bit, maybe uh, Guernica on the on yeah, because it's such um, a, for, for me it also reflects your you know your dazzling turn of phrase as Ian Black calls it, which um, you know is a, a large part of the success of this book. All right, I'm just seeking to shorten it a bit where I can. Um, all right, yes, I can see how I can shorten it, yeah. Um, all right, so, you know, I, I talk a lot in this book of, uh, about language. I talk a lot about um, unity and disunity. Uh, and um, how language is used to forge unity, but can also lead to disunity. Um, so this is to do with a recent attempt to, to impose unity in, in Syria. Um, uh, about 20 years ago, I visited the Syrian city of Hama, a sleepy place on the Orontes River, interspersed with tangled orchards and with the groans and gull, gull cries of giant wooden wheels the graze water from the deep sunk river. I particularly wanted to find a venerable riverside mansion, Beit el Kailani, that I had seen in an old photograph. The house had its own enormous water wheel uh, in Arabic, Naora, uh, and, and sometimes they're called Noria, which is a kind of garden of Naora. The house had an uh, enormous water wheel attached and was wonderfully strange, half palazzo, half paddle steamer. But it had vanished. Its site and the surrounding area were a public park planted with giant plastic crystals. My quest for the strange was more successful in the great mosque. The first thing that caught my eye in the prayer hall was a fine ancient inscription of unaccountably the first words of the Odyssey in Greek. Andra, moi, ennepe. After that, it was not Homer, and not about Odysseus, but about someone called Elias. Uh, more than that, a rusty Greek would not do. It was a double dissertation, Greek in the mosque, and Homer that was not Homer. Looking around, everything else was wrong. I knew that the Great Mosque of Hama was a wired foundation, 1,300 years old, and yet it had none of the patina of an ancient building. Much of it might have been built yesterday. There were jarring details, including an aluminium door handle that said push in English. This led into the tomb chamber of a local 13th century potentate, a member of Saladin's family. The chamber, too, seemed to have been recently and hastily rebuilt. The prince's original cenotaph had gone and was replaced by a jerry built thing that looked better than a packing case. I wasn't expecting to find that so much had been restored next to the mosque girls who were showing me around. They said nothing. And of course, I think of the first where I'll stop there, but, uh, you know, um, Hammer had been flattened um, by aerial bombardment, followed up by ta tanks and artillery um, under Hafez al-Assad. Um, and um, it was an attempt to, uh, uh, to create unity in this country, to suppress a, a rising by the um, the Muslim Brotherhood in Hama. Uh, but, you know, and, and, and he did impose unity by that by that um, bomb, bombardment, which I refer to as, as, as a kind of Arab Guernica, 
um, with Guernica with no Picasso to to paint it and with no Churchill to to uh, a, a kind of London Blitz with no Churchill to invigorate the survivors. Um, and, 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 you know, things were suppressed and forgotten and there was unity. But my point in writing about this is that in the long run, those kind of acts killing between eight and 25,000 of your fellow countrymen don't conduce uh, to, um, uh, to unity. And the present Syrian civil war is, is uh, part of the result. Following in the footsteps of. Um, mm, yeah. Listen, I have a question in for you, um, which we have to finish up on, though uh, I've loads of my own questions. <laughs> but, uh, oh. Like, where are the women? I was going to read poetry. Where? Shall I read you some poetry? Or is there no time? <laughs> Later. Well, <laughs> I don't think we're going to get to your wonderful pen portraits. I think we might have to leave those. Also, you've been breaking up a tiny bit. Um, uh -huh. Yeah, I was, I was going to say about the women in, in uh, Arab history. I mean, we, we know about the Queen of Sheba. Well, the Queen of Sheba wasn't Arab. Well, you know, it was pre, 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 but um, the Aisha, the, the prophet's wife and that. But there's, you know, are there any that leap to mind um, that were significant? Uh, I mean, the link to mind was in, that, in that reading, you know, it came up, the women's prattle, you know, that... that yeah, well, well, his wife. I mean, isn't it brilliant? She got the last. Yeah. Yeah, as sort of the nasty about the nastiest and, and most eloquent and nastiest man in our in, in Arab history is is completely flattened um, by by a woman, yeah. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, I. I uh, I, my, my, my history is, is obviously dotted with, with women throughout. It's, it's, it, you know, I can't say they play as big a role as men because you, you, you can only go by what you have in the historical documents. But um, uh, th this is partly why I wanted to get onto my portraits and, um, and, and to include some portraits of women. But, oh, can I just read maybe, one? Well, well, maybe, you know, we maybe we can record them later as a separate reading to an add-on okay. reading. Um, yeah. We'll have to discuss. Um, I did want to bring you this question though uh, from Ali El Jamri in Bahrain. Um, he, uh, I don't have the time to read all of his letter, but he, he thought it was uh, exceptional and the best history of the Arabs that I've read in English uh, in a long time. And he was particularly happy that you dealt with the Hadar Badu conflict particularly with regard to Bahrain, um, and we didn't have time to get on to so, so many other things. However, this is his question. Decolonizing academic study has become a big buzz in the past few years. The region's history is marred in colonialism, and every university, Middle East department, is explicitly perpetuating colonialism and imperialism by virtue of the term which defines the region by its subordinate relation to the West. The inverted commas, Arab world is a slightly better term, but also problematic as it invisibilizes non-Arab minorities. West Asia is underused, um, so underused that it sounds like a foreign context, a concept, but would prove best. So the question is, how can we go about decolonizing the study of West Asia and its peoples? What positive role can non-West Asian and white academics play to center the voices of Arabs and non-Arabs of the region? region? Yeah, I, I, I know exactly what he's getting at. Um, that it's it, it, if you call the region the Middle East or the Near East, uh, uh, the, you know the, the Arabic speaking region, the um, uh, the the Mashir, oh, oh, actually for that matter, it's the Mashriq in Arabic, which is which is the eastern part of the Mashriq and the Maghreb, um, the east and the west. Um, but yeah, somehow to call it the Middle East or the Near East is 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 to is to gaze at it from the West, and and somehow to subordinate it by this gaze, um, and, and and I have a lot of sympathy with 
uh, with what's behind the question. Um, and obviously a lot of what's called Orientalism is predicated upon subordinating the East and, um, and, uh, and subjugating the East. Uh, and, you know, I'm a, I'm a great admirer of, of Edward Said, but I think we can get rather stuck in his ideas and we can get a bit too worried about East and West and um, I mean, after all, we talk about ourselves in, you, or you do in either, I can't remember, but in either, you talk about your, your, um, yourselves as the, as the West. And in, in fact, you've written a novel <laughs> set in Ireland, which is called West of West. Um, uh, so, you know, ev everywhere has to be located um, in relation to somewhere else. So if you kind of strip away the, idea of subjugation and subordination and think of it, well, you know, that's just Western scholars looking at the East. All right. Um, Middle yeah, East. I mean, it, it is interesting because whenever I say the Middle East, like, I, it catches with me. And then I say with the Arab world and that doesn't feel right either. And, and yeah. this, West Asia, I mean, West I, Asia is comfortable. I'm, 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 I class myself as post-colonial, post-imperial, post-everything, um, post I think, um, uh, if I class myself as anything. But I do quite, I, I don't mind the middle, the middleness of the Middle East. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, at one stage, I, I quote a very, very interesting text, and it's from a book that I edited and translated. It's the oldest Arabic travel book. Um, called Accounts of China and India. And during the course of this, it's about 850, uh, a guy from Iraq uh, claims to have visited the, the emperor of China, the Tang emperor. And uh, the Tang emperor says, oh, you know, I, I know all about the rulers of the world. And the top one at the moment is the ruler of the Arabs, and he is in the middle. And he is in the middle surrounded by all the other countries. And this mediating position of Baghdad was what actually gave it its great strength as the center of the Arab empire and, and the, 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 the center of Arab culture that drew on, on, on Greece and, and India and Persia and um, ancient Arabia and, and, and everywhere. It's this mediating position is very, very important. And the, and the mediation of Arabs in trade from a very, um, uh, from a very early stage. So I don't think we need to worry about the middle part of the Middle East. Um, personally, you know, you may be looking from the west to the east, but you know, Arabs are looking from the east to the west. Um, I think part of um, the question's question is, is what was it? How can we, how can Western how can we decolonize? How, how can we can decolonize the study of West Asia and its peoples? Just back to the universities and, you know, how the universities... Oh, I, I mean, I, I, I would do it simply by turning my back on, on, on it's, it's difficult, you, I say that glibly, but by, by um, offloading all the colonial baggage as far as possible and going back before and going back to people like um, Al-Kindi, uh, the, the so-called philosopher of the Arabs who lived in, in Abbas times and um, if, if I can find what he said, because it's a bit germane to this. Um, I did, yeah, here it is. Um, and it's so germane to, to, to the question. Uh, it's a short quotation. Um, uh, you know, how, how can we benefit from, from scholarly views which are not tainted by colonialism? Um, Al-Kindi said this, it is right and proper for us never to shy away from admitting the value of truth, of hack, and acquiring it for ourselves wherever it may come from. 
even if it comes from races who are distant from us in societies quite different from our own. Um, and, you know, spe spe specifically, um, in, in the discussion of East and West, there, there, there is a great, um, there are a great couple of lines by Ibn al-Arabi, the great um, Sufi sheikh and um, the great thinker uh, of the 13th century AD. Um, and I try to find, to dig out, I quoted this. Um, and this is what he had to say about East and West. Uh, about the search for, for knowledge. He sees the lightning to the east, and for the east he longs. And if it flickers westward, to the west he'll lean. My love, he says, is not for places or for lands. My only passions for the lightning flash. And I think, if I can remember it, I think it's... Um, That's a gorgeous, uh, the, gorgeous quote to, yeah. to end on. Um, let me try to remember it in Arabic, because I, I ought to end with, after, after, you know, we've been talking about Arabs and Arabic, and I haven't been, I, I think it's, Inna gharami al-barqi wa lamhihi wa laysa gharami bil amakini wa turthi. That's the second Thank line. You. Thank you. I just wanted to add, too, that, you know, you have been called the most gifted Arabic travel, translator, the most gifted translator of Arabic alive today and that you have worked on a number of uh, translations um, that will all see the light of day at some stage. Uh, we're going to have to wind it up. Um, before I go, I just want to read you this. Um, I mean, you know of it. Uh, it's, it's more kind words about your wonderful book from Prince El Hassan bin Talal of Jordan. And just uh, summarizing it a bit, a bit, he wrote to you, your book is a breath of fresh air and will, I hope, go some way to dispelling the mistaken notion that all that is progressive originated in one quarter of the globe. Your retelling of the highs and lows of three millennia gives a true insight into the essence of Arab existence. As such, it is my profound hope that it will go somehow to providing counterbalance to the hatred industry, offering as it does insight into and respect for the other. Your book is also gloriously, a gloriously enjoyable read and above all highlights, not that which separates, but that which we share, our common heritage and our common humanity. Tim, thanks for meeting up on Zoom. Thanks for Zooming with me and for Thank you, to me. in Liverpool. Um, uh, thanks uh, to Yeah, and, and, and let, me, and let me say thank you as well. Let me say thank you to the the, the the guys in Liverpool um, and you know particularly the uh, being a, a Yemeni by adoption I would I would say thank you to all you Yemeni Liverpudlians and I know there are lots of you and, and as far as I know you're very active in uh, in this festival so thank you very very much and thank you Denise no. you not only have you been my my um, my support. Uh, my rock uh, in writing this book, um, but it, it's that you've been a great friend to talk to today. Likewise, well, likewise, likewise, and uh, gee, we must zoom more often. Uh, okay, so it's uh, it's good morning from Cork and Liverpool, and good evening, Kuala Lumpur. Have a good nice evening, evening from Kuala Lumpur. Um, and, uh, and Yemen, my adopted uh, adoptive land, is is in the middle, so. That's true. Um, That's that, true. That's all sent about vibes the there and, and, and thoughts and prayers and to all the countries that are suffering from conflict at the moment. And so say all of us. Take care. Bye. You too. Thanks, Denise. Bye.